John. It still feels weird for me to say that. Welcome to the Tells the Leadership podcast. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good, Joshua. How are you? I can't complain. Uh, I, a lot of these, because I'm still an active duty service member, so running a podcast is a challenge. So I'm still kind of in my duty uniform for the day. So I'm, I'm doing well. Hey, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here with you. The, the first place that, that I would always love to kind of just to start with is it, you really need to no introduction, but could you provide an overview to the listeners of, of who you are? Yeah, my name is John Wayne Troxell. I spent uh, one month shy of 38 years on active duty in the United States Army. Uh, I was a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout, spent the, spent the vast majority of my career in uh, airborne units and striker units. Um, five combat tours to include the combat jump into Panama in 1989, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, a couple times in Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. And I culminated my career as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which uh, is the senior enlisted person in the Department of Defense. And I did that from 2015 to 19, retired in 2020. And now I am, some call me a serial entrepreneur. I have my own consulting company. I consult for various businesses. I am a published author. And uh, I have my own leader development company with a good friend of mine, a former Air Force JTAC, uh, Tim Chachi Pachesa. And, uh, and I do a lot of stuff that keeps me busy, but uh, it also allows me to pay it forward to the current force and give back to my fellow veterans. So, and... In a nutshell, you have spent over 38 years of service to this nation and you're still doing it. And that's why I love doing podcasting. I generally mean that as I get to talk to inspiring leaders and patriots like yourself that are still out there trying to make a change. So kudos to you. And it's inspiring to see that. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, some people when they retire, um, you know, the average sergeant major wants to play golf, ride his Harley, go hunting, fishing, <laughs> yeah. or gardening. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, you know, I, I like being around people. I like doing things that help people out. And my wife and I still like to do things. Even after 40 years of marriage, we like to dance. We like to karaoke and have some adult beverages, stuff like that. So we're kind of uh, <clears throat> off the beaten path a little bit on how we live our lives. But uh, um, it, it's all about uh, what we can do to help others. Yeah. So kind of transitioning before we really start digging into your leadership journey, we'll just start off with the, the top of if you could define leadership in your terms. And I'm really excited for your definition because I've had General Petraeus on and I've had other really outstanding leaders, but I don't think I've ever had a non-commissioned officer to literally the highest rank that you can possibly be on. So I'm interested to see how you would define leadership. So I define leadership as an art. But it's about executing what I call the three P's. It's your presence as a leader. It's your performance as a leader and your persistence as a leader. Presence meaning where not just are you at the right place at the right time? Or are you at the points of friction? It is what happens to the troops when you show up as a leader. Do you have a certain charisma about you? Do you have a certain energy? Are you about vision, about purpose, about positivity? that is infectious to your subordinates that wants them to be around you. And then performance is about whatever you expect the men and women to do in your charge, then you ought to be doing it with them. And that's yeah. not just the, the daily grind and everything, but it's the inherent danger of combat. You know, if, if the troops are exposed to that, then the leader better be out there with them. Uh, and it's also enduring and living in, in, uh, in hardships, you know, um, we, we shouldn't have leaders living in a five-star hotel when their troops are in dang, you know, shelter halves and stuff, you know. Now I'm dating myself with the shelter half, but in, you know, in Kent City or whatever, you know. Le you know, and then the persistence is actually mastering the art and the balance of the humanity aspect, which is yeah. empathy and compassion with the discipline and accountability that is necessary to be pro productive excuse me, and effective in your war fighting tasks. And that's where a lot of leaders struggle with is balancing. Sometimes we have leaders that are over empathetic and over compassionate, and not enough discipline and accountability, and it creates a sense of entitlement in the troops. And then you have that on the other side that are 
you know, way into the discipline and accountability, but a little light on the humanity side, and you potentially have a toxic environment on your hand, and, and that creates a sense of fear, and people don't want to work, and they don't want to come to work. They don't want to be part of that team. So it's all about mastering leader presence, leader performance, and leader persistence. Mm. Th that is one thing I would love to dig in right there. How did you learn to balance that? So when I first started off as a brand new lieutenant, uh, not not a non-commissioned officer, I quickly navigated towards my non-commissioned officer brothers because they taught me the right way to lead. And, and I've been extremely lucky that I have had phenomenal non-commissioned officers really throughout my entire career. And especially when I was a brand new platoon leader and then when I was a company commander twice, I had phenomenal first sergeants, but each one had like their own distinct way of holding people accountable. Like, hey, here's the standard, but we as leaders are above that standard, but we hold right. everyone to the standard, but you do it in such a way to where it doesn't belittle someone where they feel less, but they feel almost inspired in a way to, to get up to your level and the organization's level. How did you learn to do that to balance those two? So what's interesting, you know, joining the army in 1982 and serving through almost the entirety of the 80s and the 90s, when I was brought in, we were very heavy on the discipline and accountability aspect. Yeah. And a little light on the humanity side, the empathy and compassion, you know? So here I am, I want to get married. I hadn't been in the unit, hadn't been in the army, but just a year and I wanted to get married to my wife, Sandra. And, uh, you know, I had non-commissioned officers telling me, well, if the army wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one. Okay. You yeah. know, you know, the deal, uh, the, the story. So I was groomed to be this guy that was all about discipline and accountability and, you know, always have an inflection in your voice to, you know, and stuff like that. But as I continued to grow, I knew to have a cohesive team, I had to have buy-in from the men and women in my organization. And I had to, I had to not just have discipline, I needed self-discipline out of them, meaning they owned it and they wanted to be a part of that team. So I had to really uh, get after the, you know, the human side of it and everything. Now, some people that serve with me, and uh, don't get me wrong, um, I love my soldiers so much in combat that I refuse to pass by a deficiency without fixing it, especially yeah. when it came to being ready to fight, not having ballistic eye pro on, not having, you know, no mechs gloves, you know, having their sleeves rolled up when they have a flame retardant shirt on, you know, things like not knee pads around their ankles when, when, when you're taking a knee in gravel and your knee pads around your ankle, it kind of defeats the purpose. So I was very hard on that kind of stuff because I wanted my troops to be best prepared to fight and win mm -hmm. on the worst day of their life, not just survive, but thrive, fight and win. And so sometimes you, you have to, you know, put the pedal on discipline and accountability, but the more I grew up, the more I grew, grew as a leader, I knew I had to get after that humanity aspect. And sometimes uh, leaders have a hard time doing that because they think I'm supposed to be the one that keeps people in line. But I didn't just want to be that guy that was knife yeah. edging the troops. I wanted to have a cohesive team that was in a band of excellence and that we were the best at what we were doing. And I remember as a platoon sergeant in 1992 to 95 in Schweinfurt, Germany, um, my platoon leader, as a matter of fact, I was just on the phone with a guy about two hours before this. We still stay in touch. And we wanted to be the best at what we did. We wanted to be the best at marksmanship. We wanted to be the best at PT, the best at gunnery. Not because, you know, we wanted, we were these arrogant pricks that wanted to, you know, just talk crap to everybody else. Because we knew if we got our troops into this band of excellence, if we had to go to war, then we had a competitive advantage over the enemy. And this was the 90s now when we were a peacetime military. And I'm making my guys wear body armor in the field, which was unknown, making them wear camouflage paint in the field, you know, outside the 82nd Airborne Division, then no other unit. I was in the 3rd Infantry Division. And people were like, <laughs> Why are you wearing camouflage paint on armored vehicles and everything? I said, well, you know, during Operation Just Cause, I had a guy get shot in the face, not my, there was a, 
a soldier that was shot in the face from the fifth mech uh, division because he didn't have camouflage paint on and he had a Kevlar mm -hmm. or a boat, you know, the uh, CVC helmet on and he got shot in the face by a, a, a PDF sniper. So that to me told me there's a reason to do all of these things. So um, again, it goes back to why did I care about this stuff? Because I loved the troops. And when you, when you love them like that, then you're going to, you're going to make sure they're straight. You're going to give them to just like your children, you're going to give them tough love, but I didn't want it to be tough love. I wanted to love tough, meaning I wanted to show them that I loved them by treating them like human beings and everything. Uh, but, you know, letting them know that we are going to have tough standards and discipline and performance so that we are at the peak operating capability when the balloon went up. I, I love that. And I, I genuinely believe if you can convey that to a team like, hey, you want to be part of this team, this is the standard that you have to meet. But yeah. I will also be at that standard. Absolutely. And it took me so long to kind of realize that um, and as I as I mature. And I wish I could go back in time and be a company commander again, because I would have been a way better company commander. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you hit it on the head. That goes back to that performance. You know, I didn't want any any of my troops to have to do something that I wasn't willing to do myself or or wasn't going to do with them, you know. And even as the the SEAC, you know, at the pinnacle, yeah. um, General Dunford and I, you know, Marine General Joe Dunford, my boss, we, we did the Army 10 miler and the Marine Corps Marathon every year. We did every services fitness test, you know. Why do we do that? Because we thought we would be hypocritical if we are the senior officer and senior enlisted guy in the DOD, and we weren't doing what we expected every soldier, sailor, airman, marine, guardian, and coast guardsman to do. So I think that goes back to that leading by example. And if you're willing to do it, um, it goes a long way with the troops, as you know, um, when the leader is out there doing the hard stuff with them. Yeah, 100%. That, that's what motivates people, especially I remember um, when we were doing a lot of our brigade level live fires or I had the honor, some would say the worst job in the Army, but I thought it was the best job uh, as I was a JRTC instructor for two years. And I saw, I think, 28 different rotations and I saw the good, the bad and the ugly of what command teams did. But the one common theme that I learned is airborne units typically did the best, but really it was about their leaders. Their leaders were enthusiastic when, when the suck increased, they yeah. showed up even more present and even more cheerful and even more enthusiastic. Like, Hey, it's raining. We have to dig foxholes. Great. The ground is soft. So it's a good day. <laughs> um, Absolutely. Yeah. And I that goes back to that, you know, that, that vision, purpose and positivity as a leader. Yeah. If, if you know where you're going, as a leader, you know where your organization is going. Now, certainly, you know, it's the commander and the platoon leader that provide vision for the organization. But I think every leader has to have a vision of where they want to get to. And then purpose. Why are we doing this? And it's not so much that we're doing sucky stuff. It's that we remember why we're doing it. And it's, it's to make us better and ready to fight and win in combat. And then you are, you already mentioned it, Joshua, positivity in everything we do, regardless of how bad it sucks. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's get after it and let's be positive on how we're going to get after things, you know? And, uh, you know, you, you know, the old story, you always find some ways to, you know, in a positive manner to make light of what you're doing. Like, you know, it's raining, you got to dig foxholes and everything. And, and then I used to spin it on how to, you know, make it not suck, you know, like I would tell yeah. people, hey, we're getting ready to, you know, we're in combat, we're getting ready to, you know, walk up the Hindu Kush. And I'll tell you this, ounces equals pounds, pounds equals pain. So you're going to take your necessary ammunition, you're going to wear your body armor and your sappy plates, you're going to have your communication systems, you're going to have water, and you're going to have a ration to take with you. But anything else is a luxury. Now, if you want to haul it, God bless you, you can carry it. But the more we go up that steep ass hill, the more it's going to suck. And, I, and I've seen plenty of troops that start punting stuff going up there, you know. So <laughs> trying to use a positive spin off of something that sucked to get people to, you know, learn how to be better at their craft. And certainly, you know, uh, foot marching up the Hindu Kush is a, 
a piece of the craft that you got to be good at or that mountain can snap you off. Yeah, that, that is a forcing function for sure, is that it, you're going to learn real quick if you packed your bag correctly and what is actually mission critical. Oh, I don't need this now. Um, Absolutely. I, so kind of transitioning through your military career, I would I would love to hear it because I, I did some research on you and I haven't really quite heard why you decided to join the military. What was that story of you wanting to actually serve? So I grew up, you know, um, you know, my father uh, ended up uh, going to prison, you know, for some things that he did. And my mom and him got divorced. And uh, I really never had purpose, motivation, or direction until my mom remarried. My stepfather, Ben, was a huge, uh, you know, mentor to me, you know, and everything. Um, but I was looking for something uh, to be, you know, find my purpose, you know, and, and the direction I wanted to go. And, and where I grew up at back in Davenport, Iowa, the military was always around and to go. And as I saw some of the older kids in my neighborhood that would join the military, my brother, Tom, being one of them, but others, when they left, they were like me, you know, still wandering aimlessly and, you know, gallivanting around the streets at night and everything. Yeah. But when they came back from their boot camp, their basic training, AIT or whatever, they were sinewy muscular. They walked with their chest out, their head held high. They they talked boisterously. They were more confident. And I was like, I don't know what drug they were feeding them there, but I want some of that. And so that was kind of my motivation to join uh, mm. was in how others were coming back and in such a better place. I knew this, that I wasn't a good athlete. I didn't have the grades to go to college. My, my family couldn't afford it. So I knew when I hit when I graduated high school, I needed to do something. And if I would have stayed in my hometown, I probably would have done nothing and gotten in trouble. And so the minute I joined the military and uh, and I got into it, uh, I knew I had made the right decision. I didn't know at the time that it was going to be a 38 year career. I initially was going to do four years. But, you know, met my my wife, Sandra. We expected our first child married. Now I had family responsibilities. And I knew that in order to best take care of my family, I needed to be the best soldier I could be. So promotions would come faster and opportunities would come up. So that's kind of what I did, you know, and that was the motivation to join and the motivation to stay in. And once I started uh, becoming an NCO and had responsibility again, I just absolutely loved it. And then being a, a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division and all the opportunities that came with and you spoke about it, the esprit de corps, the camaraderie, you know, the, done. Yeah. you know, yeah. And, and the, the alpha male kind of attitude there, even out of the females, you know, it was a hundred percent, you know, and, uh, and it was a division full of piranha. And if you were a goldfish coming in there, you were going to get eaten up in a hurry. And so that's what kind of propelled my career, uh, to move forward. And then having two combat tours there with Just Cause and Desert Storm, where I finally got to see firsthand all of the combat training paying off in real time in combat, that just propelled me even more to continue to keep going and being my best uh, and everything. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, as happy as I am that I've served 14 years in the 82nd, I just got word about a month ago that uh, at All American Week this week, next month, I'll be inducted into the 82nd Airborne Division Hall of Fame. So, uh, you know, wow. just an honor that I never thought I would get that is being bestowed upon me. I'm completely uh, humbled by that. Well, uh, I mean, no one is better deserving than you. Um, that, when is that in May, All American uh, Week? On the it's the, the ceremony is on the 22nd of May. So okay. it's the 23rd of May. Now, the, uh, uh, yeah, the 20th is uh, the division run. And they asked me if I wanted to run it. And I said, you done got the last click out of junior. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll be at the finish line rooting everybody on. Um, you know, I can still get after it. But I know how Pat work is the division commander in, uh, you know, four miles and 36 minutes is what the standard is. But on Pat works watch, that might be four miles and 32 minutes. And so. <laughs> Uh, I'll be more than happy to, you know, be at the finish line rooting everybody on. 
Uh, that's amazing. And I, I asked that question is because I'll be down that brag. And if it would, it would be funny if it was the exact same week or Liberty, I'm never going to get used to saying that. Yeah. Um, it, <laughs> you know, I, I, and Josh, I will tell you, I got it. I know why the names were changed and everything, but I spent 14 yeah. years there and never once. I mean, I had soldiers, you know, that were African-American, Asian, Hispanic, you know, Caucasian. I, never once did I have a soldier in 14 years come up and say, I'm offended by the name of this base. Yeah. All right. So when they changed the names and everything, I, I just told the paratroopers of the 82nd Airborne Division, focus on who you are and what you are. Don't yeah. focus on the name of the base. You are a paratrooper in America's Guard of Honor, the 82nd Airborne Division. Focus on that. Or, you know, the former Fort Hood, now Fort Cavazos. Don't be focused on that. You're on America's first team, first cavalry division, you know, focus on that, you know. And so, um, yeah, I got it. Uh, so that's how I told people to handle it, uh, these name changes and everything. No, I, I think that's spot on. Just focus on what you can control within your sphere of influence and just show up every day and be the best leader and best version of yourself that, that you can. And yeah. I know when you when you went to 82nd, you're, that was a transition between E7 to E8. Did you have to go to Ranger School before you could be a first sergeant? Uh, when did you go oh. to Ranger School? Because I knew it was a little bit later in your career. Yeah, I, I initially went to the 82nd in 1987 as an E5. And I was there 87 to 92 oh, okay. uh, as an E5 and 6. Went to Germany for three years. I came back in 95. Uh, as a platoon sergeant again, E7. But when I got there, you know, in the I was a 19 series guy. So we were in the third of the 73rd Armor Battalion. So there was no kind of rules and regulations like the infantry had about, you know, being ranger qualified as a platoon sergeant and a platoon leader or things like that. But when I came back, you know, my first tour there for five years, you know, the 80, the old ranger handshake, you know, and they'd shake your hand, they'd look at your left shoulder to see if you had a ranger tab, you know, and then if you didn't have that tab, well, then you're, you're kind of a second class citizen. So when 100%. I came back in 95, I said, you know what, because my first five years I was there, I focused on being a jump master and everything. And then on my way back, I went to Pathfinder school. So I said, this is my last opportunity. I want to go to ranger school. So I was a sergeant first class when I finally went to ranger school in uh, 1996. And uh, what sucked about being a senior NCO going there is I was the admin first sergeant from day one to day 40. And oh, well. the best thing that ever happened to me is at the end of the mountain, I got fired. <laughs> so, but because uh, in, in Darby, if one more Ranger student would have, would have pissed and moaned about that Connex getting in their duffel bag and getting dry clothes, because you know the deal. I mean, yeah, you know, it, it, People lollygag and everything, and next thing you know, you're getting smoked by the RIs and everything. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, again, leading by example, I had the opportunity to go, went and graduated and came back. What that did do, though, is when the armor battalion deactivated and there was only one uh, ground reconnaissance troop in the 1st of the 17th Cav there, uh, I interviewed with three other uh, E-8s. And I was the only ranger, and I got selected by the division CSM to be the first sergeant over there. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's what helped me stay in the division for two more years as a first sergeant um, because I had went and gone to ranger school. Being a master rated parachutist with a combat jump star helps too, you know. But yeah. uh, that was the bottom line. So, yeah, I was 32 years old when I rent, went to ranger school. So I, I so I went through Ranger School as a as a second lieutenant. So I was you know super motivated, and we're coming out of eyeball like, and I was basically told if you don't get your Ranger tab because I was going to a unit that was deploying, you are not going to lead troops in combat. So I had this burning desire that you know hell or high water, I was going to get my Ranger tab. And, you know, 90 days later, I, I loved Florida so much, I decided to do it a, a second time. Um, I ended up getting it. And I remember just like that overwhelming feeling of accomplishment. Uh, and when I showed up to my unit, just that level of uh, uh, not necessarily, I wouldn't say um, cockiness, but just that ability of like, hey, I am ready now 
to be a platoon leader and to lead troops in combat and seeing my peers that had that, but also seeing leaders who didn't have that. And I'm not saying a ranger tab makes or breaks someone. I I don't think it does. Uh, But within that setting, it sets the standard. Are you able to meet that standard that you're going to ask men and women to do now? Because at the end of the day, ranger school, there's nothing crazy about it. Uh, right. It's fundamental patrolling tactics at the individual squad and platoon and company level. Uh, and you have to master those. I like to think of it's like a, a, a master's degree in, in patrolling. Absolutely. Yeah, it is the Army's toughest leadership school because it, all of the tasks you're expected to do are basic tasks. Yeah. But you're starving. You haven't had any sleep and you got a bunch of tired you know, ungrateful assholes you're trying to get into, a, <laughs> into an effective fighting organization yep. to be successful. And, uh, and and it's that's what makes it tough because the art of influence and leadership is alive mm. and well there because everything else is basic, you know. I mean, basic patrolling and stuff like that, basic raid, ambush, recon, that kind of stuff. You know, what's interesting, uh, when I graduated in 1996, the, the folks that I went to ranger school, like one of the guys is a guy named Kendall Clark, who's now a brigadier general, and he's uh, the assistant division commander for operations in the 10th Mountain Division. He was a second lieutenant, you know, and I had a me being a sergeant first class and I had a bunch of second lieutenants, you know, I, it, there was a lot of informal mentorship I had to do, you know, like the, the big second lieutenant football player straight out of I. Bullock, and we're in the patrol base, building our fighting positions and everything. And all of a sudden I smell a, a turkey tuna with noodles. And this dude is over there <laughs> handling the tuna with noodles when we're supposed to be working. And I'm like, hey, dude, 86 the freaking chow and get your ass over here. And of course the RI smelt the chow and we got our bag smoked for that. So, hey, but, but it was all good, you know? I mean, water resupply. I remember so many, uh, you know, stories from that and everything. But that shows you, um, and, and, as a matter of fact, Kendall Clark and I are very close to this day. Uh, and that it all became because we were in the same squad in, in Ranger School together. And now he's a general officer. So um, good times. I knew he was going places. So I served under him. I was the HHC company commander in 2-2 Infantry. Yeah. Uh, and, and when I, uh, I think he was getting ready to transition out when I was leaving. Uh, but a uh, phenomenal leader. And he actually put me in for, I call it the Dougie back there behind me, the, the oh, Douglas yeah. MacArthur Award. And I and I had the privilege of representing Force Comm as, as the representative from the 10th Mountain Infantry Division. But he was a phenomenal leader. And it, I, it's funny that you went to Ranger School uh, with him. That's a yeah. small world. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, but to your point about Ranger School, um, and, and you're right, it's not the end all be all. But you know, the people that criticize it the most mm. are the ones that either went and failed or, yep. you know, never went. And so uh, I think you gain a greater appreciation from that 67 days or the extended scale, like you did, you know, down in Florida <laughs> a couple of years. Yeah, I had end, to work on my fitness. <laughs> in the end, I just, I was, uh, I was over in Europe with the 2nd Stratford Cavalry Regiment on Thursday, and uh, there was a young 2nd uh, Lieutenant there I was talking to. He had spent six months in Ranger School. He he had recycled every phase. And I said, you know something, sir? I want you to look at your Ranger tab and look at this guy's over here. What's the difference between them? Nothing. They're the same tab. It just, you you went, you went decided to stay, you know, six months instead of the, the normal two and a half months, you know? And so in the end, graduation is the key getting across the finish line is the key and uh and that's what i uh continue to tell people is don't worry about if you recycle or whatever or if you have to come home because you failed a critical task fix that and go back i mean you can always go back as long as you don't quit on anything you know you're fine 100 percent but so kind of transitioning back into your career, you get through that rank of first sergeant. When was the decision point that you decided that you were going to stay in the army for the long haul? Well, I think it really hit me. I think you start, you know, looking instead of down and in, you start looking up and out 
And for me, it was yeah. as, at the Sergeant First Class position, especially in Germany at the time, because, you know, I, as I was a young NCO in heavy units, you know, my 670-1, my leadership manual, that kind of stuff is what I focused on. Uh, but when I became a platoon sergeant in Germany uh, of a, a scout platoon, the number one thing that I carried with me was my unit attack SOP, you know, and it was about how do we perfect our battle drills, our war fighting tasks, our missions that we are expected to do in combat. And this was after I had, you know, my experiences in combat with the 82nd in Just Cause and Desert Storm. And then as I started looking up and out, what were adjacent units doing? What was my higher headquarters doing? I wanted to deliver the why to the troops on, on why we were doing what we were doing and the direction that our formation had us going. And, and back then it was uh, Kosovo and, and uh, the former Yugoslavia breaking up and stuff like that. And the opportunity that we may end up having to go and fight there, which eventually we sent troops there, but I had already left and gone back to the 82nd. But that's what there propelled me uh, that this is what I want to do because I'm more and more responsibility I got, the more infectious it became to me. And when I, I when I was having an impact on 30 troops uh, as a platoon sergeant, I wanted 120 troops as a first sergeant. And then I wanted 500 as a sergeant major. It was just, I wanted to have that much more of an impact. And, and I told myself, as long as the army will let me to continue to serve, and as long as my family is happy, I'm going to continue to serve. And never did I think I would spend 38 years, but uh, the more the opportunities came, the more I wanted to continue to serve. So I think at the Sergeant First Class rank is when I finally bought in that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, you know, or the rest of my career. Um, and that's why I stayed so long. When you transitioned um, into being a command sergeant major, what was that role like for you? Um, because I know each one of the ranks, at least from an officer side, I had to learn to delegate more, um, stretch myself more, give more power away, um, if, if that makes sense, because the tasks yep. are more demanding. So if I'm going to be successful, the team's going to be successful, then that means I need to empower my team, give them more tools, give them more authority, uh, mission command at the end of the day. That's what I need to actually practice. Uh, but from your lens, uh, as you grew, what made you successful at that key developmental rank? Because well, there's think, not that many people. Yeah, I I think first and foremost, what I did, and I think to be an effective command sergeant major, you have to go in with your commander, understand the commander's vision, mm. what their priorities are, and then where do they see your role? And then you have a conversation on that, okay? And what for me, I would... What's your vision, sir? What are the priorities? I understand what we as a squadron or a battalion are expected to do in combat. I know what our mission essential tasks are for the organization. But I would take all of that in based off the commander's vision and priorities, and I would develop focus areas that would complement my commander and then provide them the pulse of the force from, uh, from me as the command sergeant. But more importantly, because I understood the direction the commander had us going and what we were expected to do, it was easier for me to deliver the why to the mm -hmm. troops. And you know, uh, Joshua, when the troops know why they're doing something, how long they have to do it, and what it's supposed to look like when they're done, regardless of how much it sucks or, or how dangerous the, the combat is, they'll get after it. And yeah. they'll get after it in a precise military manner to get the job done. Um, but it's when they don't know, you know, the why. And I always hear leaders say, well, I, I don't have time to say why. I said, we, we give the why all the time in our operations orders. You know, in our mission statement, we provide the who, who what, where, when, and why. You know, <clears throat> when we give a task out, we give a task and purpose, the why. And yeah. so as a command sergeant major, that's what I focused on. You know, giving feedback to the commander on their their vision and priorities and the direction the organization was going and then delivering to the troops the why. And I did that through 
my kind of leader focus with my first sergeants and platoon sergeants, focusing one and two levels down so that I wasn't micromanaging. Yeah. Some command sergeant majors think they come in and they're they're the savior of Joe, you know, and that's <laughs> exactly the wrong way to go about business. All right. The troops have a team leader, a squad leader. They got a platoon sergeant and a platoon leader and everything. So your job as the CSM is to mentor one and two levels down, just like commanders do uh, one and two levels down. You know, battalion commanders mentor platoon leaders as well as company commanders. So and, the, and as you go up, it, it's still that way. So that's what I focused on, having good leader development programs for my inner circle, you know, my first sergeants and platoon sergeants, and getting after the vision and priorities of the commander through developed focus areas that I came up with that I shared with the commander to make sure we were in sync with the direction we were going. And then around all of that was the commander and I leading by example in everything we did, whether it was PT, whether it was living in the field, whether it was doing marksmanship, whether it was doing hand-to-hand, -hand, whatever we were doing, you know, it was leading through our example. I think leading by example is one of the most powerful things. Uh, at the end of the day, leaders have to be effective at communicating. And I love how you talked about delivering the why, because that's a theme that I'm seeing. And if you go back to uh, ADP 6-22, purpose, yeah. direction, motivation, the definition of leadership, in my mind, purpose is that why. And to effectively communicate to someone, you have to take the time to explain why they're doing that, not just at the tactical level, but also like strategic level. I remember being in Afghanistan, Nalgam doing some patrols around there. And to the guys were like, hey, why are we going out here and walking around in this desert trying to get shot at? <laughs> well, and that's when the actual votes were going to take place in yeah. Afghanistan. And what we were trying to do was to disrupt the Taliban from influencing that voting pattern. And all by the way, we were right where Mullah Omar created the heart of the Taliban yeah. uh, in Nalgam. Um, so when I showed that to them and I could explain it to them, you could see a pep in their step. I'm like, all right, I'm actually out here and I'm doing great things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I will tell you, even, you know, I, I went to uh, visit some of our elite Navy, our most elite Navy special operators in Somalia uh, when I was the SEAC. And as I got off the, you know, the, the rotator plane to get there, the, uh, the squadron commander for that SEAL unit said, hey, how does this end? I said, well, what do you mean? Sorry. He said, all right, you know, I'm here doing, you know, counter-terrorist, counter-insurgent kind of stuff, but how is this thing supposed to end? What, are, what direction are we going here in this country? So I understand how we fit in with the foreign policy for the country and our, how our combat actions are going to support that foreign policy. And I learned then, even at the strategic level, when I was representing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Secretary of Defense in my travels, I had to deliver the why. And the more I did that, the more people were like, wow, OK, I got it. We'll get after that and everything. So you're exactly right. Whether it's tactical, operational, or strategic, the troops have to know why they're doing something. What's the purpose? And then, you know, as much as possible, what's the end state when we get done here? Yeah, I, I love how you talked about that before because you hit the nail on the head, pulse of the force. Uh, at, at the end of the day, even in your time as the senior enlisted advisor, like that's what you did. You, you yeah. were the pulse of the not just the Army but all of DOD. Uh, so I got to hear the story of how Etool Nation started. <laughs> okay, so um, this all started when Secretary Mattis was sworn in uh, by President Trump as the Secretary of Defense. And it was on a Friday uh, in January of 2017, he got sworn in. And his first engagement on Monday morning was breakfast with myself and the service senior enlisted. So Dan Daly, Sergeant Major of the Army, Ron Green, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, and the others' services. And the first thing when we showed up that morning, I showed up a few minutes early, and the secretary called me in. He said, hey, have you read your charter? And I said, I have, Mr. Secretary. And he says, well, you advise me as well as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And I said, roger that. He said, so when I tell you to, I want you to pack your stuff. You're going with me. I said, roger that. And then he told me, he said something that morning, uh, you know, to the media. And he said, 
we're not going to talk about defeating the enemies of the United States. We are going to mm -hmm. annihilate any threat to the United States. And I thought that was powerful because that's a message that commanders like you and troops and leaders all over the world want to hear. They don't want to hear, 100%. you know, some, some remark like we're talking about one of our enemies, like we're talking to toddlers. Okay. And so he told me, get the word out. And he told myself and the service senior enlisted to get the word out about annihilation. And the more I got around secretary Mattis and, you know, being around general Dunford who were two of the most phenomenal leaders I ever served with, I knew as I was delivering the why to the troops that I needed to echo their themes and messages. And so I happened to be in Syria with our most elite Army Special Operations Unit, and uh, I was there for uh, the fight in Raqqa, and I'm up on a roof of a building with uh, the guy that's in charge of, of the fight. As a matter of fact, the main effort for the lasting defeat of ISIS and the guy in charge of the fight was a dang master sergeant promotable from <laughs> our most elite Army Special Operations Organization, and it was him and his fire support guy who was another master sergeant up there that was just bringing Royal Scunion on ISIS <laughs> as the Syrian Democratic Forces were moving in contact. But anyway, so I'm up there and I'm also up there, the JSOC senior enlisted leader, the SOCOM senior enlisted leader, and the unit sergeant major are up there with me on the roof of this building. And we're watching this fight unfold. And every time there was a pause, there would be a Mad Max looking vehicle borne IED that would come out and would detonate on our SDF fighters and our, you know, special operations advisors, or a female suicide bomber would come out. And they were a very, very resilient enemy. And so finally, I just said, you know what, these assholes have two options. <laughs> and, and uh, I said, they can surrender or die. You know, because we had been talking about that during this trip with uh, some of the operators, uh, a Sergeant Major by the name of George, who's now retired, a really good friend of mine. I, I befriended him there. This is a guy that had spent 20 years in that unit, been wounded oh, wow. about six times. And so we were talking about leadership in combat and things like that. And we started talking about the E-tool, you know, as a means of killing, you know, whether it was whatever we needed to do to neutralize a threat, that there had to be some kind of non-standard way we did that. So anyways, I'm on the roof of this building. And uh, the unit sergeant major, a guy named Rob, says to me, so what do you mean by that? I said, well, we're a peace-loving people, so if they surrender, you know, we'll safeguard them to their detainee holding facility cell, give them three hots and a cot, and we'll give them due process in a court of law. But let there be no doubt, if they choose not to surrender, then we're going to kill them with extreme sure. prejudice, by either by dropping bombs on them, shooting in the face, shooting them in the face, or if need be, beating them to death with our entrenching tools. And he says, you know, you ought to put that in your uh, update to Secretary Madison, General Dunford. So I did that night when I sent my, my update to them. And Mattis replied back in less than an hour and said, keep saying that. That, you know, compliments my annihilate any threat. And so I adopted that surrender or die kind of thing just to provide an inspirational message to the troops all over the world, you know that purpose, motivation, direction kind of thing. And it was never an issue with that until it was Christmas Day, 2018. And I was on a USO tour with General Dunford and I'm in Cobb, or excuse me, Bagram in a theater or in, in a hangar. And uh, we've got all the troops there. We've got all the USO celebrities and everything. And my job was to fire the troops up before the celebrities came out and entertained and everything. So Dunford and I are on stage. He gives his opening message and he hands the mic to me and Medal of Honor recipient Flo Groberg is on the stage with me too. And Flo and I have entrenching tools in our hands. I had been saying this surrender or die speech everywhere. So I got up there and was really impassioned on how I said it and demonstrative with the e-tool and the troops loved it. They went bananas. But afterwards, I was approached by a reporter from the Washington Post. And he said to me, Hey, I can't believe you just told the troops it was okay to go out and commit war crimes. I said, I didn't do anything of the sort. We train soldiers, Marines, and battlefield airmen how to use non-standard weapons 
to neutralize enemy threats. And he said, well, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to make this a big deal. I'm going to do an article about it and everything because I think you're wrong. And I said, knock yourself out, dude. And then as he walked away, I thought about it again. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, so I reached out to my public affairs guy at the time. Yeah. Master Sergeant Rob Couture, who was back home in Fort Meade, Maryland, unwrapping Christmas presents with his family. And I said, hey, this Washington Post guy says he's going to blow up this surrender or die stuff. He said, let's beat him to the punch and take the air out of his story. So, <clears throat> excuse me, he asked me to send him a photo with me holding an e-tool. And, uh, and then he took the quote I had and he put it with that picture and we put it on social media, on Facebook, Twitter at the time, Instagram, you know, and put it out and it went viral. Okay. Because I was using this language talking about killing terrorists. And when I say viral, it, it was picked up by CNN. The Fox five did a show on it. You can, you know, YouTube and, and find that. New York Times was bashing me. The German, Belgian, and French media picked it up. Japanese and Korean uh, media picked it up and everything. And all of a sudden, this thing went viral. Now, in, in regards to the troops, they loved it. Yep. It was a message they wanted to hear. And I was getting messages from all over the world from leaders, commanders, senior enlisted leaders saying, thank you. We need to hear this message. But people in Washington, D.C. didn't like it too well. Some, you know, senior officers were like, who is this enlisted guy, you know, speaking out of school, you know, and I even had a Navy three-star admiral come into my office and say, you need to walk this back. You shouldn't be talking like that. And I said, hey, look, Secretary Mattis and General Dunford are okay with what I said. I'm echoing their themes. If you got a problem, go talk to them. And he says to me, you realize that enlisted are meant to be seen and not heard, right? Oh, wow. And I was like... Admiral, it's best that you leave my office or we can <laughs> we can be some fighting MFers in here tonight, you know. But the landscape started changing on me in Washington, D.C. And all of a sudden, yeah. um, it long story short, it culminated. I was uh, an IG complaint was filed against me saying I was using torturous language, uh, creating hostile and toxic conditions and, and everything else. And uh, there was a few select people that I know uh, that were involved in that. One was a senior enlisted guy. Another one was a general officer, none of them in the Army or the Marine Corps. And uh, and so I was suspended for six months. And, you know, the first day I was feeling sorry for myself, like, geez, I, I've been a leader. I've been a sergeant major for 20 years, and I've never had something like this happen to me. But then after day one, I said, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to back down because people were telling me to retire and everything. And I said, no, there's, so I went into general Dunford and I said, sir, there's only two ways this thing is ended. You're either going to fire me and make me retire, or you're going to reinstate me and put me back to work. I am not going to quit because if I quit, then it's okay for any other troop out there across the joint force to quit anytime they want to. So I stuck it out for six months. And in the end, you know, I was held accountable for a couple of minor things, but I was reinstated. And when I finally got back into my office after six months, I told myself, I am not going to change who I am as a leader, uh, I'm, but I'm going to be more cognizant of my inner circle. But the bottom line, what this did, Joshua, and there's a, a Marine officer, her name is Kimberly Sontag, that I worked with. Uh, she was on the chairman's team, a very high speed uh, Marine officer. And when I was reinstated, I had so many congratu congratulatory statements sent to me and people saying, hey, welcome back and everything. And she sent a message. She put a message on Facebook with the story while I was reinstated. She said, relax, America. He's back. And <laughs> uh, and that just fueled me to that I did the right thing. But what it did is because the minute I said that using the entrenching tool, I was getting thousands of these e-tools sent to me or people coming by wanting me to sign them. And to this day, I've signed over 6,000 of these things now. Wow. And, and it, it took the entrenching tool from a multifunctional tool to now is a weapon of war. And it's something. So what I did is, is you know, to put a positive spin on it. And I made e-tool nation my nonprofit and what I do to, to give back. Uh, I, I have, you know, I'm a huge sports guy and I have 
three veteran athletes that I sponsor through eTool Nation. One mixed mm -hmm. martial artist, one female world record, strong woman and power uh, lifter and a, uh, a bodybuilder. And so I use it in positive ways now to, to get after it. And, and in the end, I wrote my memoir, you know, and uh, the title of it is Surrender or Die, Reflections of a Combat Leader. So, um, so I tried to spin this into a direction that people uh, could look at what I went through and could be inspired by it and everything. But I will tell you this, and, and I'll, I'll end this story with this. If I didn't have a leader like Marine General Joe Dunford that mm -hmm. was going to allow the process to work its way through and was going to stand by me to the end, I wouldn't have been there. I will tell you, there's there are leaders in our ranks, senior leaders, that would not have the intestinal fortitude to stand by their sergeant major, their senior enlisted leader, like Dunford did. And then in the end, be, reinstate me and put me back to work. I, I've seen several instances where commanders and, and, and senior officers have said, uh, you know, well, I've got to send a statement to the big army or whatever. And they, you know, have lost faith and confidence in their senior enlisted and they send them down the road. So I'm grateful that I had a boss like Joe Dunford and a boss like Jim Mattis that never lost, never wavered in what I was doing, you know, and, and readily put me back to work. I, I think we we need more leaders like that who choose the hard rights over the the easy wrongs now. And it's unfortunate because I'm I'm a major now, but I can I'm seeing more field grade officers and I'm spending more time. And it's so political. Um, it, yeah. it really is above those ranks. And I just miss being around soldiers uh, and then helping make a positive impact. And and I I definitely understand you know working. Um, at the Pentagon as the senior enlisted advisor to the chairman and just being surrounded with people who necessarily aren't uh, of the same opinion of you. And they're always looking for a little chink in the armor that they could potentially exploit and having leaders like that, that are willing to go to bat to you is makes the difference. Um, so that's amazing. So yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so transitioning out, what was that like? 38 years in the military, and then one day you're a civilian. So I knew this was the end of the road. You know, I couldn't go any higher in the enlisted ranks. So when I, I when I assumed the duties, as a matter of fact, the Army had to give me an extension to go beyond 35 years to serve. <laughs> and uh, when they sent me the letter that approved my extension, they said, your extension is approved, but be advised, no more, no other extension will be authorized. This is your terminal assignment. Wow. So, you know, I didn't need that letter to tell me that this was my terminal assignment, but I knew it. So, um, so I never, you know, prepared myself. Mentally, I knew I was coming down and I was going to be retiring, but I never went through the steps to get ready. So I was kind of behind the power curve. Thankfully, I had a great staff that helped me out, but I wasn't going to look back, Josh. I was going to continue to look forward. And so I welcomed that I was leaving, all right, because I had I had reached the pinnacle of the enlisted ranks. I had served for almost 38 years, and I was ready to go and see what I could do uh, next, you know, and I wanted to spend more time with my family and everything. And I think you never lose selfless service. And yeah. had General Milley asked me to extend, uh, I probably would have. You know, there was talk that he was going to ask me to extend. Um, but uh, I was ready to go. And and when I left, I told the guy coming behind me, CZ Colon Lopez, my good friend. I said, here's my cell phone number, brother, but I don't want yours. Because if you need me, you can call me. But I'm not going to be calling you and checking up on you. You're the SEAC now. I'm a retired guy. And so I focused on what I could do next. And I wanted to, you know, give back, pay it forward, but make life comfortable for my family. I wanted to take on the corporate world. And so I've done that for the last four years. And I've had some investments that have tanked on me, you know, a couple of them, one just recently that's got me out of tens of thousands of dollars, but I have, I've had plenty more that have really worked out for me. 
And my ability to consult for several businesses has made life comfortable for us. But more importantly, I have the same purpose that I had on active duty, although I'm looking at it from a different angle. I mean, I have no problem walking out of a shop at on post. And if Joe ain't got his headgear on pumping gas, <laughs> I walk right by it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, not my business anymore, you know. Plus, if I did walk up with a retiree ID card to the kid, he probably knows that I have zero authority and he'd either tell me to F off or beat my ass right there at the gas. <laughs> so so I focus on what I can do and, and and the direction that we're going. And my wife, Sandra, and I, you know, as I said before, we've been together over 40 years. We constantly talk about how much longer I'm going to do this. Initially, we were on a five-year plan, but yeah. things were going so well, we gave ourselves an extension. And we're going to keep doing things and keep giving back and and keep trying to make life comfortable so that we can – we have changed the economic trajectory for our families to where now we can provide a future for our grandchildren yeah. that they wouldn't have ordinarily had. And it all comes from me joining the army and then meeting her in El Paso, Texas and getting married. And then here's where we are now. So the transition wasn't rough for me because I was looking forward. And I will tell you, um, I am perfectly happy being a retired guy that still gets the chance to go out and PT with the troops or, you know, come and speak to them. Or like I said last week, spending a week in Europe uh, visiting with troops at uh, RAF Mildenhall in the UK and uh, Vilsack, uh, Stuttgart and Ramstein in Germany. And uh, so I'm a happy camper and, and life is good. And uh, some of those companies that you founded when you, got out was definitely etool nation the uh, nonprofit. Yeah. so pme um yeah, so. Me hard .com, you know physically mentally and emotionally hard it's yeah. kind of that was my mo motto you know this gets back to you know sucking it up and 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 driving on and being a champion not a victim and, and in order to be best effective we have to be physically mentally and emotionally hard not 100 strong or tough but yep. the exact opposite of soft and so, yeah, that too. And then, you know, I, I support the U.S. Chambers nonprofit. I, I'm, I'm an ambassador for Beaver Fit USA, ESSI, where downrange supplements uh, are supplements that are in every commissary uh, in the, the Defense Commissary Agency. Uh, also, uh, others, I have spo other sponsors and stuff too that I work with, Muscle Mac, Protein and Rich Macaroni and Cheese, Nirvana Water, and folks like that, and then Adaton software, uh, just to name a few of what I'm doing. And like I said, I've, I've got a leader development company with a guy named Tim Chachi Pachesa called Lead LE9 D. You know, because we're two retired E9s that talk about evolution. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so life's good, and, and you know, and then I, you know, I'm a published author too. So just uh, in a really good spot now and just excited about what we do every day as a family, but more importantly, what I do every day to assist the troops and veterans and their families. And what, what drove you to write that book? And then also to if someone listening to this podcast wants to go find it where, what's the best place to find that book? Yeah, they can find it on barnesandnoble.com or on Amazon, or they can go to my website, pmehard.com. Uh, to order it. So <clears throat> the eTool Nation thing, you know, the whole eTool story and being suspended for six months and then, you know, doing the combat jump and Operation Just Cause, being yeah. a 38 year veteran, everybody was telling me, and then retiring as the SEAC, everybody was telling me, hey, you got to write a book. You got to write a book. You got to tell your story because it's interesting. And so I, it was never, I just didn't know how to get after it until I met a guy on a flight coming back from Tampa one day, who was a published <laughs> author. And, and he introduced me to, well, he Googled me and he said, have you thought about writing a book? And uh, I said, well, yeah, but I don't know how to get after it. So he linked me up with his author coach, a lady named Ann McIndoo, who's been an author coach for thousands of authors. And uh, she came together with me and she got my story out of my head onto paper. And we went from concept to publishing in 90 days. That's wow. how much he helped. 90 me. days. 90 days. That gives me anxiety. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I knew that if I if I prolonged it, that I would procrastinate and yeah. it, it it wouldn't have got done. And plus, with my busy schedule and everything, I didn't want to have to deal with it on the road. So we got it done, got it published, and uh, and the book is doing well. And the other thing is, you know, I'm now a uh, expert analyst on a show on the History Channel called the The Proof Is Out There Military Mysteries. You can catch it every Monday night at 10 Eastern time on the History Channel. I am one of about 20 uh, expert analysts. My episodes haven't come on yet, but they'll be coming soon. Now, again, this is uh, a, you know, a show that is kind of off the beaten path for me because they're asking me about military mysteries like Hitler's hidden gold in Poland and, and uh, the nuclear weapon that almost went off in the 60s and in mm-hmm. North Carolina and stuff like that. And and everything. But uh, so, yeah, I've got a lot of things going on. And uh, uh, and the book, like I said, Barnes and Noble, Amazon or PMEHard.com. So you're definitely, definitely staying busy in retirement. I feel like we could have a whole other episode on just all of the extracurricular activities or serial entrepreneurship endeavors that you're doing. That's amazing. And it's inspiring. It really is. Uh, Because I think that that is the heartbeat of this nation is veterans who get out and they continue to make this country the best country in the world. Uh, And I genuinely believe in uh, believe that. So we're at the the final show segment. I call it, you'll like this. I call it the killer bees. Out of respect to your time, I try to keep it uh, at the one hour mark. And it's to be brief, be brilliant, be present, be gone. It's the same four questions that I ask everyone on the Tells of Leadership. And if you're ready, we'll jump into it. Let's do it. So what do you believe separates a good leader from an extraordinary leader? I believe it is uh, being authentic and Mm -hmm. having a a certain energy and enthusiasm about you and that is uh, in, delivered in a positive way. I love it. Question two, what is one resource that you could recommend to our listeners? Uh, and for, for leading? For leadership development, self-development, anything that's really helped you on your journey? So I, I just recently became a John Gordon certified trainer trainer and teacher of Mm. the power of positive leadership and the power of positive teams. So I would recommend people go to see John Gordon has published almost 30 books. He's a leadership coach for Sean McVay of the Los Angeles Rams, uh, Eric Spolstra of the Miami Heat, uh, several executives and everything. Go to read. If you read any books and these, his books are normally like 120 pages. You can read them on an airline flight. But if you read the Power of Positive Leadership, The Power of Positive Teams, and The Energy Bus, those three books, I will tell you, are very inspirational. And they're off the beaten path, but in the end, it's about leadership, inspiration, building cohesive teams. And John has become a serious uh, mentor for me uh, in the times I've spent with him. In the last two months, two months, uh, I got certified through him, but uh, also I've spent uh, hours with him. And you know, when you look at where can I look to for mentorship and everything? John Gordon is one of those guys. I've never heard of any of those books. So I'm, I am I read so many books in a year. Uh, so I'm really excited to dig into those three. Uh, all right. I'm breaking my rules. So question three is if you could give, go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be and why? Patience and tolerance. Um, sometimes I would make rash decisions. Uh, Mm -hmm. that I didn't have all the facts or that somebody had screwed something up that I didn't have full context on why they screwed it up. And I either thumped them pretty hard uh, or I made a decision that really needed a little bit more process and everything. So patience and tolerance. I love that. So question three, how can, or question four, how can our listeners find you and how can they add value to the missions that you're currently on right now? So you can find me, my website, pmehard.com, but I'm also on all social media, uh, on Facebook. If you go to Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, make sure you get the right one, the John Wayne Trossel with the blue check mark, because I have hundreds of people that are impersonating me out there. But I'm on all social media, and I am constantly posting about what I'm doing uh, around uh, 
my travels with the DOD. I was just down on the southern border. But the key thing people can find me on is my YouTube show, Leader Talk. Uh, I'm on I'm on YouTube as well as uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. But I, I go on there and I talk about raw and authentic leadership. And they can people can watch my show. The last show I did was about situational understanding and situational awareness and how we're lacking that. Uh, in our country today and in our world and how that could potentially cause us to be an easy threat to terrorist attack or violent okay. attacks. And I also talk about my recent visit to the southern border and spending time with our Customs and Border Patrol folks. So that's where people can find me at. And again, like I said, the books on Amazon, Barnes and & Noble, and everything that you want to know about me is on my website, pmehard.com. This has been an amazing podcast episode. And I, I mean, this is that I think I've taken over eight pages of notes and I didn't even get to half of the questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, but my wife would kill me if I spent more than an hour. <laughs> well, hey, I, Joshua, I appreciate one, your leadership and still serving and everything. But two, giving me the opportunity to come on here today. And I'd love to come back whenever you'd have me. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being a guest. Awesome. Thank you.